Hello. In this video, we'll continue with our discussion on characterization and we'll focus on the definition of what exactly is a capital asset. Now, before we talk about what is a capital asset, I strongly recommend that you watch the characterization introductory concepts video because it discusses why characterization really matters. And the thing I want to emphasize is that if we look at characterization, there's different characters of gains and losses. Some gains have preferential rates, lower rates than other gains. And if we're advising taxpayers, or we are a taxpayer, we want to get as low a tax rate as possible on our income or gains. To get the preferential rates, which comes through the flavor of long-term capital gain, we need three specific items. We need a sale or exchange, we need a capital asset, and we need long-term um, holding. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but these are the normal rules. So a sale or exchange has its own set of definitions that are separate from sale or other disposition that we talked about when we calculated realized gain or loss. Sale deals with the conversion of property into cash. Exchange is when a property is converted for another piece of property that is materially different in nature. And this seems very similar, again, to sale or other disposition. A lot of times it is, but it does have a separate area of law. It's a very important to understand that. Now, if you're taking the CPA exam, you're taking an, an exam in accounting or a law course on taxation, usually the sale or exchange element item is not something that teachers like to emphasize. It's usually the other items, the more mechanical aspects of the characterization elements. So once you have sale or exchange treatment, you then go on to determine whether the asset is considered a capital asset. So if it's not sale or exchange, under the general rules, you cannot get capital gain or loss. It's going to be considered ordinary. So we have a sale or exchange, we go on to capital asset. Well now the next question is, what exactly is a capital asset? And that's what this video focuses on. Well, the actual tax law starts off by saying that all assets are capital assets unless otherwise specified. So the code has actually a definition. It defines it by saying unless otherwise specified. Unless otherwise specified, a asset is a capital asset. And we're going to talk about really six different ways or different types of assets that are not considered capital assets because they're specifically carved out. So that's really the way that the code goes about this. It talks about which assets are carved out, are carved out. Okay, so unless otherwise specified, your asset will be a capital asset. Very important to understand. So the first type of asset that the, that the code carves out as not a capital asset is inventory. And you really do need to learn these. Write these down, do note cards, inventory. Inventory is never a capital asset. Inventory. Inventory. So again, please, I would I would always tell my students whenever they learn which assets are not considered capital assets to learn this using um, note cards. Write these down. Memorize these. So inventory is the first item that is not a capital asset. The next item is trade or business real property. The third item is trade or business personal property that is subject to depreciation or amortization of its personal property. Now note that the real property is any real property. It doesn't have to be subject to depreciation. So this includes items like land. So the third item is trade or business personal property. Personal property subject to depreciation or amortization. So a few things I want to mention here while I'm continuing to write this. The first thing is you notice trade or business. So if you recall from my previous videos, we talk about the big three when we talk about deductions. There's really three categories of activities when it comes to deductions. The first is trader business activities. The second is investment activities. And the third is personal activity. Personal in nature meaning like your personal residence or you own property you only use in your personal activity. Okay? So we're talking about the trader business aspect of the big three. We're not talking about investment or personal. We're talking about trade or, vi or business. And it's determined under that set of law, trade or business. Okay, very important to understand. Not investment, not personal in nature. 
Another thing you notice here is we talk about real property and personal property. And in previous videos, I discussed the difference. The difference is that real property is the land and everything attached to the land. So this includes buildings, fixtures on the, on the buildings, uh, fences because it's attached to the land. It's items that are attached to the land. Buildings, fixtures, fences, items that are attached to the building that's attached to the land. All that's considered real property. Personal property is everything else. So all real property has to be tangible. Personal property can be tangible or intangible. Now, personal property can be depreciable or amortizable. And in order for it to not be a capital asset, it has to be considered depreciable or amortizable personal property. So you might be thinking of, well, when can, you, when can a trader business have personal property that's not subject to depreciation or amortization? Let's, talk, let's think about tangible personal property. Can you think of any tangible personal property that's not subject to depreciation? Well, depreciation has a connotation through economics that the value or the, not the value, but the item itself will um, become either obsolete over time or it will have wear and tear. So what we're trying to look for are items that will not become obsolete or have wear or tear, but maybe they will actually appreciate in value the opposite. I can think of one. When you go into, let's say, a, um, a dentist's office or a physician's office, a, a medical doctor's office, what do you see on the walls? You see some art. And a lot of times, dentists and medical doctors, especially if they have money, they have some very, very, very well-known artists. What if they have a Rembrandt on the wall that's priceless and actually is increasing in value because as time and time goes on, time and memoriam, right, that item actually gains value. A lot of art does that. It gains value. So that would be an example of trader business personal property that's not subject to depreciation. Some art on the wall that's actually appreciating in value. Okay, now I want to bring note to these two items because these two items make up about 90% of all the different assets out there in the economy. Bit, trader business, real property, and personal property. Okay, again, personal property has to be subject to depreciation and amortization. Okay, very important. Now I put asterisk next to these because I'm gonna mention an exception to a few items later on, but make sure you put asterisk next to those because it's possible that this trader business real property and trader business personal property can be can still get long-term capital gain treatment. I'll mention that at the end. The reason I'm going to mention at the end is because there's a few other items where this could, this could potentially pop up. Okay. Again, I want to note that the real property is not has, does not have to be subject to depreciation, so it's not just buildings. It also includes land or items of real property that are not depreciable, which really is just land. Okay, let's go on to the next item. The fourth item, and again, you should be keeping track of these. I strongly recommend you, rec you memorize these because if you're taking an exam, whether it's a CPA exam or you're taking a final exam in, or any exam in your course where you have to be, where you're tested on these items, you have to know these like that. Like that. Okay, you can't just think about it and spend time, especially if it's an open book exam. You have to know this. And obviously, if you're taking the CPA exam, which is closed book, well, you have to know these items. These are, these are This is the prime area of testing. Very, very, very important. If you do not memorize these items, you are going to be in trouble when it comes to actually passing the CPA exam or doing well on your actual exam, whatever exam you're taking. Okay, very important. So the next item that's never a capital asset, accounts or notes receivable. Accounts or notes receivable are never a capital asset. Okay? So if you recall from the introductory video, if it's never going to be a capital asset, then it's going to be an ordinary item. So inventory, accounts receivable, notes receivable. When these items are sold or disposed of, they result in ordinary gain or ordinary loss. Always. Okay? Let's go to the next item. The fifth item is supplies. Okay, the fifth item is supplies. And again, supplies, we're talking about items that are not capital assets. So supplies are never a capital asset. Okay. Now the sixth item is something that we're going to spend some time talking about because it can get a little, a little tricky. This is probably, I would say, one of the hardest ones. And this deals with a, 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 a whole grouping of things. I like to create it, I like to call it the self created intangible 
sorry, so the self-created copyright intangible carve out. Okay, and we have to talk about some specific things here because it can get it can get quite tricky. So the first tricky thing actually deals with the timing issue of applicability of dates. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 actually expanded this self-created intangible rule. It was again originally applied to copyrights before 2018, but after 2018, it specifically comes and deals with an issue related to um, not only copyrights, but also uh, patents, formulas, secrets, and inventions. So I'm gonna talk more about that, but going forward, just so you know, it's important to understand that this applies to copyrights before 2018, and we're going to talk about the rules with respect to copyrights, and then I'm going to come back at the end, I'm going to talk about the application after 2018, because you're going to see the only thing that changes is this rule, and again, it's more expanded to other intangibles. So at the very end of this video, I'm going to give a summary of the old law versus the new law, and the change on this respective intangible issue. So it's really important that you watch through because you'll get the understanding that it's going to become more expansive 2018 and after. But right now we're talking about number six, specifically of copyrights, the old law. So I usually call this a self-created copyright intangible because that usually makes up almost every, every possibility. Okay. So if you recall, or if you don't know this, okay, I have uh, videos on this topic, but copyrights usually deal with um, literary, music, artistic, letters, memorandums, or similar items. Okay, we're talking about, um, you're not talking about scientific items, you're talking about more artistic, literary, compositions, music, that kind of stuff, letters, letters memorandums, books, right, novels, that kind of stuff. Okay, so if you have a self-created copyright intangible, okay, so, um, and there's, and you don't have to have a copyright, this is interesting. So it doesn't have to be a copyright, but usually if you do have something of value that is in one of these categories, usually you do get a copyright. So I'm just going to write down the items. So this is the more specific, but again, the self-created copyright intangible is just the general idea. So if you have a copyright, okay, or these are like groupings that the code actually um, lays out. So this one you have to just kind of um, think about all the different possibilities. Literary music or artistic composition literary music or artistic composition you have a letter or memorandum letter or memorandum and then anything that's similar any similar item so what's described above? Any similar item to the above. If you have a copyright or a literary music or artistic composition, a letter or memorandum or anything similar to the literary music, artistic, letter or memorandum, anything similar to really those. Now again, copyright, you can get a copyright on these items. You can get a copyright on these respective items, okay, literary, music, or artistic composition, you can get a copyright for, right? Now, the reason I say copyright is because if you have a copyright, it's automatically in this. But if you don't have a copyright and you have a literary, music, or artistic composition, letter or memorandum, or similar to, has to be similar to these two categories, okay, then it really depends on how you hold it. So this is very important. Depends on how it's held. How does the taxpayer, how is it held by the taxpayer? Certain taxpayers, if they hold a copyright, or if they hold a literary music or artistic composition, or a letter or memorandum, it might not be a capital asset, or it might be a capital asset. So the first one is if the taxpayer created it. So the first one is if the taxpayer created the item. So if the taxpayer created the copyright, if the taxpayer created a literary music or artistic composition, the taxpayer... Um, created a letter or memorandum, then in the taxpayer's hands, it is, not, it is not a capital asset. It is not a capital asset. The second is that if the ta taxpayer was written to, and this really goes to the letter of memorandum. So if you're saying, you know, let's say you have a letter that's written by Abraham Lincoln, 
and it's written to a military um, he, uh, general or a military um, colonel or major during the Civil War. Maybe they've become pen pals or friends. And Abraham Lincoln writes his letters and it says, Dear Major Smith, okay? Whoever the letter is, is written to, it's you know meant to be to, okay? Or if you have music and the music is written to that person or a poem or whatnot and it's written to that person, their, their actual name is in it, then the same thing. So we'll say the taxpayer is written, um, or the item is written to the taxpayer. It's written to that taxpayer, written to. The perfect example, again, is a, mo a, a poem, mo poem, a letter or memorandum. So if it's addressed to that party, and that party now owns or has the um, letter or memorandum, well, that is considered a, not a capital asset. Finally, the third item, and this one's a little tricky, is if the taxpayer's basis Adjusted basis, which I have videos on basis. If you need to go learn about basis, if you haven't learned about that concept yet, please watch those videos. It's, I would stop the video and learn about those um, the basis con concept. But if the taxpayer's basis is carried over, is carried over from number one or number two, the taxpayer and number one or number two. So it's determined by the taxpayer that either created it or it was written to. And it was transferred. So a perfect example is a gift. We have, or we learned about the basis rules for gift, and we learned that the general rule is that the taxpayer, when a gift occurs, the new the donee carries over the basis of the donor. If the basis was determined in the hands of the previous taxpayer that was create that created it or was written to, then the new taxpayer again. It, if it was gifted, perfect example is a gift, it will not be a capital asset. So let's say the donor writes um, writes a song, and the song is worth millions of dollars, worth millions of dollars. And um, the song is then gifted to the, the donor's son and um, carries over the basis to the donor's son. Well, because it was a carryover basis, so basically carryover means that the donor, the son, steps into the shoes of the don of the um uh, so the donee son steps into the shoes of the donor um, that created it and now because of that carried over basis principle guess what happens the donee now when the donee later sells the song let's say later on it will not be a capital asset it would be ordinary it'd be ordinary income ordinary gain so it's very important to understand very important now there's one exception to these three okay again it, so when we have a copyright or a literary music or artistic composition, letter memorandum or anything similar to these, again, we have to look at how it's held. If the taxpayer created the item, then it, it can, cannot be a capital asset. If the taxpayer, if the item was written to a taxpayer and the tax, that taxpayer is now holding it, it's not going to be a capital asset. If the taxpayer's basis was carried over by anybody or by another taxpayer that um, created or was written to, so it's transferred over, um, that basis, again, the taxpayer steps into the shoes of that previous taxpayer, then you're not going to have capital asset. There's an exception to this, okay, that deals with music compositions. So after the law was written, music, music compositions, there was a special carve out for songwriters that says, okay, we'll give an exception, grant an exception to um, for music compositions to the party that created it or is written to Okay, really it's meant for the party that created it, um, so songwriters. Songwriters get special treatment. Okay, that's just one special exception to know about. I don't want to go too much into it, but songwriters get a special um, uh, exception to all this. So going back to number three, okay, or any of this. So when, to holding, so when would a taxpayer not or be considered a capital asset to have to have this type of uh, copyright literary music or artistic composition or letter memorandum well if the taxpayer would purchase the self-created intangible from the previous from the owner that created it that would now be a capital asset because it's not self-created they didn't create it another example is what if um, the taxpayer uh, owned the song it's worth millions of dollars and they died and it was transferred through um at death at death 
Well, that potentially could be if, if, if the basis was determined at fair market value. If, if it was determined based on carryover basis, at death, then again, it would be here, number three, it would not be a capital asset, but if it was fair market value, then it would be um, it would be considered a uh, capital asset. So I would go back over number six. Again, I want to clarify number six. I call this the, I'll just put this in quotation marks, the self-created copyright intangible except, exception to the what are considered capital assets. But really what it encompasses, copyrights, literary, music, artistic compositions, letters, and memorandums. These are all separate. All of these are separate. You don't have to have all of these. They're separate. So if you have a copyright that's self-created, okay, you are going to be in not a capital asset. That's what it's saying. If you have a literary, music, or artistic composition that's self-created, you're not going to be a capital asset. If you have a letter or memorandum, not going to be a capital asset. Or anything similar to literary, music, or artistic composition or letter or memorandum, you know, you can think about things, poems, um, novels, uh, various books, all these are, are considered artistic. Artistic composition is in that group. And again, we have to look at how it's held. The taxpayer that holds the, that, that creates it, that holds it, it, to them, it's going to be considered not a capital asset. If it's written to, it's not a capital asset. And again, if a taxpayer is, let's say, gifted it, well, the basis was determined by the previous person that created it or was written to, then it's not going to be a capital asset. But any other possibilities, it will be a capital asset. Okay. So there are a few other um, carve-outs in the code of what is not a capital asset. So unless otherwise specified, an asset is capital asset, right? So an asset equals capital, right? Again, unless otherwise specified. So an asset is capital unless otherwise specified, which I provide some exceptions. Inventory, trader business real, pro real property, trader business per pro personal property, subject to depreciation and amortization, accounts receivable or notes receivable, supplies, and the self-created intangible exception. These are the six big ones. Some other examples include U.S. government publications. You might ask, why, why do they have something for U.S. government publications? Well, for example, presidents. Every president they get their memoirs and whatnot. They get various um, items that they're allowed to publish and sell and do things with. They have the rights to it after their presidency. Um, various items like memoirs and whatnot that they can um, letters written to the um, to the president and whatnot. That and they have value. So during the Richard Nixon era of presidency, there the law was changed where U.S. government publications actually are not considered capital assets, and there's some. Uh, possibility out there that this was done because um, people or you know Congress didn't really like Nixon um, <laughs> maybe it was a Democratic uh, Congress so they created this rule that you know basically hurt Nixon okay very interesting some other examples include financial instruments involving commodities so a financial instrument involving commodities will not be a capital asset another example is a hedging transaction uh, hedging transactions will not be considered capital assets now, um, I put some asterisks here on number two and number three, the trader business real property, trader business per personal property um, that's subject to depreciation and amortization. Now, I'm going to, in, in a later video or a video that's out there that you need to watch, there's this topic called Section 1231. Section 1231 provides, if you will, an exception to this. These properties, number two and number three, trader business real property and trader business personal property that's subject to depreciation and amortization they might still get long-term capital gain treatment. It's possible through Section 1231. So I would strongly recommend watching that video, especially after this, because you need to know when 1231 could potentially make these capital assets. But you're saying, oh, I thought you needed a capital asset. Again, these are the normal rules. Another item, so as I mentioned before, sale or exchange. You need sale or exchange, and yes, that is that is normally the case. There is one exception that under section 1231 for possible involuntary conversions. So possible involuntary conversions can get capital treatment through section 1231. So the sale or exchange requirement, act, which is which you almost always need to have to get capital treatment, and again, the preferential rates, you might get a carve out through section 1231. Capital assets, you need to have a capital asset. Again, all assets are capital unless otherwise specified, and we went through six of the major ones, and I mentioned a few of the non-majors, okay? And there's, by the way, I mentioned all of them. Those are all the ones mentioned in the code, 
Okay, and again, that's how Congress does it. They say all assets are capital except for these items. But you know, they basically define by exception. The last item is long term. Long term, and this is um, for the next video, which talks about holding period. The asset has to be held for more than one year. If it's held for more than one year, it's considered long term. And that 1231 exception that I mentioned for sale or exchange and capital asset, this one you can't get out of. You have to have held the asset for more than a year. So this is an absolute. To get the long-term capital gain treatment, you have to have held the asset for more than one year, regardless of the circumstance. And you'll see that more in the 1231 where you need to have held the asset for more than a year. Now the holding period discussion, which is for another video, brings it brings into light some interesting issues like, well, what if you inherited the property or what if you were gifted the property? Do you get to carry over the holding period? So please see that in the next video. So again, I just want to reiterate, to get a long-term capital gain, normal treatment, we need sale or exchange, okay, sale or exchange, unless there's an exception, exception for 1231, um, you need capital asset. And the capital assets are all assets except inventory, trader business real property, trader business personal property that's subject to depreciation or amortization, accounts or notes receivable, supplies, and the self-created copyright intangible. And I mentioned three minor ones dealing with U.S. government publications, financial instruments involving commodities, and hedging transactions. Those are very rare. Th those are not that common, but really focus on these six. So when you're doing your um, exam preparation, whether it's a CPA exam or your exam, I recommend making flashcards. What are the items that aren't capital assets? Inventory, trader business real property, trader business personal property that's depreciable or amortizable, accounts receivable or notes receivable, supplies, self-created copyrights, and I have that all listed out here, depending on who held it, right? If it's self-created, it's automatically um, going to be, by that person, not a capital asset. So one last thing. And I mentioned that I would talk about this when we talked about the self-created copyright intangible rule um, that's not considered a capital asset. And that is the effect of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So I talked about the effect before and after. And there really wasn't too much of a difference with the rule. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, it keeps all this the same. The only thing is that it takes number six... It takes number six, which is here, the self-created copyright intangible. So now it expands it, the self-created rule, um, not only to copyrights and these types of things, but also it applies to patents, inventions, secret formulas or designs, and these kind of things that are like this. But again, it has to be self-created has to be self-created. Now this is really interesting because there's a code section, section 1235 that I'm not going to go into that was not um, taken out from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So that interaction between 1235 and this provision, that's something for you to look into. Um, that's another issue, but not part of this, but it was added to that. So the self-created copyright intangible is expanded and that starts, so as of 2018, this is expanded. We expand this rule for the self-created copyrights to include this. So everything still applies as of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, 2018. The only new thing starting 2018 going forward, so if you're looking at this way before, after 2018, the only thing I changed was the self-created copyright um, intangible rule just was expanded more to include things like patents, inventions, uh, secret formulas. And the important thing is that these items, patents, inventions, and secret formulas, have usually historically had very favorably a very favorable treatment in the tax law. So this is actually very interesting that it was added on, and actually it was added um, as a revenue raiser for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that this helps you understand what exactly a capital asset is with respect to making the determination for um, whether you have long-term capital gain, the sale or exchange, the capital asset, which again is the focus of this video, and then finally getting that long-term greater than one year treatment. And again, focus that there has been um, one major change that self-created copyright intangible in terms of classifying what is a capital asset and what is not.